All right, bonjour, un autre livre pour tout le monde. Yeah, so this is um, Cultural Genocide in the Black and African Studies Curriculum by Dr. Ben. Um, great dude. He was one of the first people that I read to bring me into all things African history and all of that. And um, so I wanted to read some more of his stuff because I just wanted to. Uh, I first heard about him via, you know, YouTube and that sort of thing. And so his lectures pulled me in because I heard him saying a lot of things that I just was not used to hearing people say. And it was like he was expressing feelings that I had that I had never been able to verbalize, especially in regards to religion. Uh, so one of my favorite books that he uh, wrote was The African Origin of Western Religions. Uh, that was great. OK, so I do want to say a little bit about um, his Wikipedia. <laughs> I read his Wikipedia stuff, man. And I just think whenever they start saying, I mean, like one of the first lines was, uh, let's see. Uh, while most mainstream scholars such as Mary Leftwitz dismissed him because of his basic historical inaccuracies in his work as well as disputes about the authenticity of his educational degrees and academic credentials that's in the first two sentences so let's already bring up the controversy and, and they do that with so much so it's just I just really didn't like it you know, that really speaks to how they're going to leave this man's legacy when it comes to um, mainstream. Right. But when you hear some of this stuff in this book, hey, it's up to you. Uh, but he was a Jew. So he speaks a lot about black Jews. And uh, I, I, yeah, it's crazy. So let's let's jump into it. All right. So I'm going to I'm not going to show the PDF, but the so the book was written in 72 and then I guess republished in 89 and um so in the foreword from 89, uh, he says, when this work was first published in 1972, the academians and black and African studies programs throughout the United States, almost without exception, virtually ignored the challenges raised by Doc Ben in this work. All right. The challenges. So a lot of times what I've learned is that, you know, you can have a lot of good points, but if you're not presenting them in a digestible way for the people who you would maybe want to argue, debate with then they'll use all the other stuff. Like I think about, you know, Umar, <laughs> Dr. Umar Johnson, how he can say a few, you know, he can sprinkle some truth, but if he's surrounded by a whole lot of nonsense, that little truth gets lost in the mess. Who wants to talk to somebody who's right, you know, like a broken clock, right? Um, but I don't see him this way, but only to say that I could see how he could ruffle a lot of feathers, but the truth, the research, the scholarship. Can't question that. Let's keep going in the forward. Uh, the indefatigable Dr. Yosef was a senior lecturer on the Faculty of Languages at Al Azhar University, located at Nazar City, Arab Republic of Egypt. Um, I do want to say he had this. Uh, so he said this one story during one of his um, lectures about when he first met Marcus Garvey and how he was so impressed, inspired by him, and how fast he was talking and just getting his words out and how articulate it was and how powerful it was and how that really inspired him to, you know, take the path that he took. Um, so that was his contemporary for a short time when he was little. So I thought that was great. Anyway, um, let's see. I think this is still in the foreword. Uh, the notion of miseducation was not unknown to me, but to link miseducation with cultural genocide was mind-blowing to say the least. In fact, I had graduated two years earlier from a quote Negro college, Norfolk State, and I had to constantly fight with my colored Negro history professor on the glories of our story with my limited knowledge in the field. Nevertheless, I knew even then that the half had not been told. So, yeah, um, it's awesome. Okay, let's jump in chapter one. Uh, so this was... Um, Again, maybe my third third book of his that I've read. Uh, so there were a lot less typos, but he writes in the same way. Like he has like he, he puts things in all caps a lot for, for like emphasis and it just flows like he's speaking in a lecture. So in that way, I'd say he's not a great author as far as the the structure, the flow, you know what I'm saying? But the content, psh, 
Sheesh. So it wasn't a hard read. Um, and it's not a very long book, so I recommend it. Um, but these black politicians could not distinguish between morality and bestiality. Bestiality. They are surprised at the action of a people who exterminated almost everyone on the continent of North America, exterminated millions more in South and Central America, exterminated practically everyone throughout the Caribbean islands and enslaved millions upon millions they did not exterminate on the continent of Africa. Um, they would have also secured all sorts of indictments from grand juries and from grand juries after grand juries. And they would have demanded that all concerned with this act of bestiality name be made public, equally the protected New York Memorial Fund that paid the lousy $100 for each body they used for their insidious autopsies. Um, let's see. So he was just uh, saying how, you know, um, uh, let's see, this genocidal... Uh, yeah, he just talking about like the hypocrisy of the genocidal attacks that have taken place here and how if it was done to like a white minority um, somewhere in Europe, then it would have been grand juries. They would have done all this kind of stuff. But the way that we view the history is uh, that's the problem uh, that we don't talk about genocide. I can even think when I mentioned it to one of my colleagues at some point just a few months ago saying like, yeah, well, you know, the country being found in a genocide, that's that's kind of what we got to battle with and they were just like dead silent like that wasn't something they were used to speaking about not like it rubbed them wrong necessarily but they definitely weren't used to that type of conversation and and it's not something that we're used to though it's so clear so for me the fact that he was saying this in the 70s again it just reinforces the fact that all the things that i'm coming to know in my young age uh people came to know decades ago and they had been speaking out about it but they have been um, suppressed in a lot of ways and just unknown by others. Um, so definitely not pushed. Uh, let's see. It could never happen here. All right. Fourth, when did the Egyptians become a different, quote, race of people to the other Africans that they should have been treated separate from the so-called, quote, Negroid Africans? Now, some he does in all his books is he mentions all the different ways that they label and name Africans. So he'll go down the line from Africans, Bantu, Egyptians, Negroid, Negro, African American, um, and, and the list goes on. He'll just list them all. He'll be like, but I'm talking about the same group of people, <laughs> you know, blacks, you know. Um, let's see. Let's see. So he has a lot of uh, followers too. Oh, I do want to show this nice picture of him as well while I keep going because uh this this is nice this is him with um dr john henry clark man another giant just just doing what they do doing what they do okay let's keep going all right uh so it also has a lot of pictures like a lot of things he's saying here is things i've read in other books so i like um anthony browder or um Dr. John Henry Clark, most African scholars or um, folks who identify as African or black, um, they mention a lot of this stuff, you know, and they're saying it over and over again. Um, but he's going after people, uh, particularly in the 70s. So that's what really caught my attention this time around, because it would be similar to someone writing a book right now about all the things that are racist or biased or discriminatory or whatever today in a lot of ways it sort of reminds me of um well what's his name Eli Mistal in his book about this uh, of the second amendment everything going on in the context of he's addressing the issues we're facing right now he's challenging the things that he's dealing with that he's saying and the way that they're interpreting the constitution right now going after particular people and all of that that's what he does in this book he's going after particular people and groups and challenging them speaking for those who um maybe they're not used to hearing um different opinions or um uh, he's also speaking to students like me young people 
Uh, all right. So anyway, Albert Shanker's United Federation of Teachers Union, AFL, CIO. Uh, he keeps coming back to that. The United Federation of Teachers, UFT. Um, this excuse for history is no different than the UFT struggle to suppress community school community control of the schools and black community so this is uh very familiar in the 70s um to speak about uh this kind of integration segregation battles going on um okay let's see my highlights are a little off here so it's taking a little time i apologize i definitely recommend recommend watching this on like 1.5 speed or listening to it on 1.5 rather than uh or 1.3 um, kind of help through because I don't speak fast enough that you'll lose something by speeding it up so I definitely recommend that uh, let's see all of which have been carefully recorded in Sir Edward Hertzlet's three volume work this is on page one the map of Africa by treaty okay that's why I put that in there so he goes after a lot of different maps speaking about how the bias exists in the way that they talk about Africa and for me, that reminded me of how I was reading about finances and I'm seeing all of this Eurocentric bias and I'm seeing all this stuff, but I'm not hearing anybody talk about this because I'm not in conversation with other people reading those texts necessarily. So what I'm seeing is coming from my little um, knowledge of history. The more that I read, the more I know, the more I'm starting to see different things in texts that I used to just accept at face value. And that's what he's doing here. He's going after texts and not accepting things at face value. He's seeing the discriminatory, um, inherent, unconscious bias and just calling them out as racist, right? Like these people don't have to necessarily, oh, he calls them white liberals throughout the text. He's talking about these white liberals, white liberals, white liberals. Oh, let's keep going. Okay, so he um, points out this lesson plan about the African American, uh, the um, African studies curriculum. Um, so that's exciting. Because this is when it's first coming up now. I can remember reading the um, list of texts for the South Carolina Board of Education. Where my kids are. And uh, seeing how it was only one or two texts for, quote, black history or, or African American history and a long list of history books. And it said something even in the um, uh codified law by the board of education like in the state law it had something in there and i'm not going to quote it right now i can't remember but it specifically addressed black history specifically i just thought that's just crazy that's just crazy but that's what we deal with right um to learn that aim so this is a lesson plan to learn that all races have been slaves at one point or another in history um, now he hits all over this lesson plan, but that jumps out even at me right now. So the lesson plan, the topic is slavery and the aim is to learn that all races have been slaves at one point or another in history. That is not it. That's just, oh man, relate the suffering of the Jews as written in the Bible to the suffering of black people under slavery. Ask, why did Jews want to escape from Egypt? Three. Discuss how the story of the escape of the Jews from bondage gave hope to the American slave. <laughs> so the American slaves should be looking to the Jews for inspiration and hope. And uh, and we're going to actively try to uh, relate the suffering of the Jews in the Bible to black people under slavery. So when I think about growing up in church. Uh, this is it. This is why they, we have we have literally been taught to identify that way. And uh, not to mention the racism that's inherent in the Bible that he's going to point out. Oh, man, it just. OK, five. Sing. Go down, Moses. Tell class the following. Legend has that this song was written about Harriet Tubman, the heroic engineer of the Underground Railway. Who led hundreds of slaves to freedom in Canada? Um, okay, now he starts. <laughs> the implication here is that there were no ancestors of the quote African American black child among the ancient quote Jews that were allegedly quote slaves in Egypt for African people like themselves, 
all of whom were called Egyptians from the biblical story about Noah and his sons. And he just keep he has really long sentences too. He gets out a lot of points, and that's like in the vein of Marcus Garvey. Um, so I, I just highlight little bits and pieces, but it's definitely worth to read or just listening to his lectures, man. If you hadn't heard his lectures, God. Um, uh, by the way, I do want to thank uh, the viewers who have uh, one watched and subscribed to the channel, and two have recommended other books, which I've gotten and i continue to get um because that's really what it's about like coming out of this colonized southern accepting conformist very much a slave mindset um and i know it i'm quite aware of my own um uh, brainwashing at this point um it's a lot of work to get out of this thing and it's not something i can do i, I can say oh i read 100 books i'm good no way like my my speech has to change my thought processes have to change my behaviors have to change my perceptions on the world have to change my reactions have to change a lot is in the work right now so i'm just doing it live <laughs> you know um but yeah just just continue to help out man because we all if you're anything like me we got a long way to go um so yeah let's see um what else is this if it is not a part of the racist and bigoted religious quote semitic now i can't do all his quotes man because he he quotes so much um you get the books like he'll put things in quotes over and over and and like capitalize this and, okay anyway let me start over. what else is this if it is not part of the racist and bigoted religious semitic syndrome to which we are all being subjected and as we have been for more than the past 100 years in white studies institutions whose curriculum is always predicated on the great white race of the judeo-christian mythology which not too long ago even excluded those who now can be simultaneously semites and caucasians within anglo-saxon caucasian indo-european indo-european aryan american civilization yeah that was a question <laughs> if this is not a part of the past and current anti-negro anti-black anti-african anti-nigger negrophobia of white races america both christian and jew alike then nothing else is or ever was okay uh let's see of course these teachers understanding of history of the united states of america shows very little improvement to their knowledge of that of africa as they seem to be unaware of the fact that the enslavement of the african black people extended to the northern eastern western and central areas of what is today the united states of america the only difference being the degrees of enslavement to the present day so here i was thinking about because he's speaking about the black studies he's he's thinking he's speaking to black educators he names them uh, later on but uh he's um speaking all about education so for me i was like yes uh that's the problem is that you can't enforce something in schools and it be effective if the teachers aren't doing the work themselves like he's only able to speak about these things because he educated himself on it it wasn't a curriculum that was required of him he had their requirement being inspired by individuals and by movements black movements and african movements but it wasn't um, in the education system. So for me, it's like, I just, uh, the same way I felt like with um, Elon Mistal, uh, that uh, like to just even argue with this system, to even point it out is just, ugh. but I'm grateful for it because he pulled me in. You know, everybody has a point of entry. So if you speak to your um, institution that you're engaged in about what you see in it, you know you're helping somebody else out for sure so i mean that's what he's doing for me um but i'm just like man like unless the parents start learning history unless the teachers start learning history on their own um i don't, I don't see how they're just going to be forced into knowledge of this stuff because they'll dismiss it and even as they teach it they'll dismiss it i've had math teachers that way that weren't good at math and so i didn't care for that math teacher or I've had math teachers that didn't care about biology at all. Oh, my biology teacher, I just did not like her. She would just have us read the pages in the book. If we asked her a question, 
she was like, well, let's read it together. But like nothing was was deep set in her mind and like she was passionate about it. She obviously didn't care. She was like, they told me to teach this subject to y'all. So here you go. And that kind of detachment from the subject matter affected me as a student. I was like, well, this isn't important because you showing me it's not important. Anyway, that was a digression. Let's keep going. Um, uh, 21. So he's quoting something from the uh, from the Bible, I believe. Now, these are the ordinances which you shall which you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years and then the seventh. He shall go out free for nothing. Um, I just forgot, man. I actually forgot about the talk of slave. This is chapter 21 of Exodus. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. He keeps going. One must wonder if the teachers who prepared said work realized the Holy Torah or Old Testament is one of the, the fundamental documents that justified the enslavement of one man by another. The enslavement of the African Americans in the southern parts of the United States of America equally in the north and elsewhere was basically moralized upon biblical quotations used by the Christian church and its theologians from the teachings of Jewish scholars and rabbis like those of the 6th century European Talmudists who wrote the racist interpretation of Noah's drama already shown in this work. Like I told you, man, long ass sentences. Um, this kind of racism and religious bigotry provided a seed that is producing the deep-seated hatred we are experiencing in Forest Hills, Queens, and Carnesee, Brooklyn, over the residents of black adults in the form of Al-Qaeda. Okay. So he's speaking to people in New York, obviously, right? Um, the malady continues because black educators do not research for ourselves on the main. We do not deal with the works of black authorities as authority, even when such scholars are from the motherland, al kabulan Africa and writing from an African black frame of reference, not even from the outstanding works of blacks like professor, professors, Chancellor Williams, and now he goes on a long list of names, Samuel Yeti, Frank Snowden, John Henry Clark, jo Joel Rogers, Carter Woodson, George Jackson, Wilfred Carty, Cyril L.R. C.L.R. James, George C.M. James, and countless others, right? Uh, let's see. So my note here was uh, the tendency is not to question the truth presented. On what authority do they stand? Group popularity, consensus, history shows the fallacy and shakiness of this. So um, what happened? Um, yeah, so I've definitely been in that camp. <clears throat> I've definitely been in that camp. And it's similar to um, being in a group where someone says something, but no one really likes that person that much. And so they don't really respect his opinion that much, his or her opinion that much. Um, or maybe it's the minority of the group, the only girl, you know, and so they don't really. Yeah, she can say what she is, but, you know, we know who really runs it. This guy, you know, but what that guy says, yeah, she might be kind of right, but we're going to do what this guy says. We're going to go by that guy. Um, similarly with academia, man, and I, I'm, uh, well, I wouldn't say brand new to that, but for most of my life, <clears throat> I never operated like, I never operated like that truth was, um, the authority of truth was always placed in somebody's hands. Um, and I wasn't free in that way. Let's see. Uh, why are we not surprised of this type of buffoonery on the part of the integrationists and amalgamationists, buffoons who always find their voice to condemn black studies, but never white studies? And why are we not aware of the age old maxim that reminds all of us? He who pays the fiddler calls the tune because we have been too much accustomed to having white miseducators constantly as the authorities who decide who are our black formerly negro heroes and what should be taught about them particularly when said heroes or heroines were involved in killing their white slave masters taking back to white folks and ever not wanting to live among white folks not to mention those african americans who are still living and fighting in the present um so yeah man i mean yeah. Okay. 
one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest Negro that ever lived in American history when in fact addicts did nothing whatsoever towards relieving his fellow Africans from their enslavement in the 13 colonies he died to make free for white U- European Americans who were fighting against white European slaveholders I had not heard someone um, speak against the um, elevating, you know, Crispus addicts to such a degree, you know. Uh, but he was forced upon us as a black or Negro hero, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. But he, I mean, he has a lot of a lot of good points. Now, the first, the start of this, um, these quotes aren't as powerful as the ones to come. I'll just say that. These were kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. I remember that. Or, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's a nice little twist to it. Um, the other thing is I'm seeing things over and over again from a slightly different perspective. Now, he's attacking it, but at the same time, it's coming from a very scholarly point of view and from a perspective that kind of reminds me of Marcus Garvey, like being able to flip it to uh, as if like say it was white people that way and to articulate that very well because you know the person who's been oppressed can always say what if it was you can you imagine if you put yourself in my shoes like just just flip it i mean oppressed people can always do that be empathetic it, it like comes with depression or something it's like easy to just flip the script but for the one doing it Oh my God, they just can't do it. So he is really good at articulating what that flip looks like um, in regards to a lot of these historical figures. Um, Addicts died to, oh yeah, read that. Uh, Let's see, at the time when Washington and Jefferson were fighting against somewhat of a type of their own enslavement by their fellow Europeans from Great Britain, they had Africans enslaved and were practicing both cultural and physical genocide against them both being the owners of two of America's most extensive slave plantations and stud farms. So again, here I'm like, even he was speaking out against Washington and Jefferson. And he goes into Lincoln too. Um, So it's like these things that I'm hearing uh, today in documentaries and all this stuff, it's no different from what was said. uh, Let's see, 1970 was 50 years ago, 1972. 50 years ago they were already making those same things and of course it's like the suppression of history right so thinking that oh i didn't know that but the people knew it that lived it and when those stories get passed down from the ones who were there orally it doesn't get lost so i think about like the book hammer and hole um about what was going on in alabama and how it didn't get to me how a lot of those stories of things that happened in alabama never got to me why because my family was in a different section of that whole uh of the black community um and separating yourself from that set can separate you from from your own struggle and we separate ourselves from the struggle so i look at myself today and think how am i separating myself from the struggle what stories am i not going to be able to pass down because i didn't want to be involved in it so so if my children or children's children are uh, dealing with things similarly, but they have no movement in memory about how humanity has faced this problem before because they're not going to learn about oppressed people fighting it, you know, um, especially when the victors win again and suppress it, you know. Uh, so it's just a very um, I see it a little clearer now, you know, what I mean, a little clearer. Black educators admitted to this. Oh, I just admitted it was a typo. Anyway, yes, Negro males marry white females way out of proportion to the reverse for white males and Negro females. But why? Because black educators have failed to make Negro males realize that our white Christian and Jewish colleagues propaganda about the oversex Negro males found in the piece of six century CE European Jewish mythology about Noah and his family's genealogy is at his best white Caucasian or Semitic racist bunk that the skin of the white man makes her no different beneath than under the skin of any black woman. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, so for me, it was how um, statistics are being used racially throughout history. And it makes me think about the census and um, gentrification and redlining and how we, we use our maps and sciences oftentimes um, to push our ideologies and our um, cultural philosophies to think of Kwame Nkrumah consciousism. <laughs> Uh, okay, but are we to forget that the data did not reveal the statistician's personal prejudice and bias with respect to his or her, quote, Negro this or that? Uh, let's see. But worst of all, they were raped in the presence of their black husbands who were bounded with hands and feet tied to neck and testicles. Do we tell any of this? Do we tell them any of this, black educators? Why not? Do we not tell them about the same treatment the Nazi Germans did to European Jews and Christians? The entire gory details about lampshades from human skin, gas ovens, chemical baths, etc.? Certainly, we most surely do. Are, okay, I won't keep going with that. Um, African people of Ethiopia that were exterminated and maimed for life by Benito Mussolini. Uh, let's see, he gives some other examples here. Thus, there was no need at all for any military tribunal or a civilian tribunal to try the fascist war criminals as the Nuremberg Tribunal was tried Nazis that committed crimes against innocent civilian victims. After all, the fascists only committed acts of torture against and exterminated thousands of, quote, savage natives of darkest Africa. So his point here is the hypocrisy in it and also i was just stunned by his knowledge of these things because again this this comes from his own research into a lot of the genocides that happened in africa a lot more of the genocide that happened in africa as well as what was going on here um so he's he's coming from a very factual standpoint by the way he has a huge you know references and bibliography and oh of course, of course he would. Um, so he's not just like talking out his ass, right? Um, let's see what page I'm on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, I kind of jumped around. Yeah, my bad. 10 and. Yeah, that's so why I got him used playing. One moment. This is an interesting PDF I acquired. Okay. So, uh, some of those quotes about the, uh, I had jumped ahead, but yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, no one in his right mind would consider Pharaoh Ramses II, dictator Adolf Hitler, and King Hanan heroes of the European and white Jewish people. Um, why then expect that African Americans of either the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Yoruba, Voodoo, or any other religion to accept their own African ancestors, slave masters, and masters of their genocide as heroes. Uh, yeah, so that was just a great point. Like, we are taught here to celebrate people who were a part of our genocide, physical and cultural. And we literally learn to celebrate these as heroes because the history was not for us. Um, I mean, that just makes it so clear and it still isn't, you know, so we have like a battle of that. So this CRT thing is really, you know, when you hear Trump talk about like, oh, they're trying to get rid of this person, that person because they killed my ancestors. They supported the institutions that killed my ancestors. They literally did. I mean, and you want me to celebrate them? <laughs> you know, um, and it's just a hard thing to grapple with. OK, but anyway, but why not the same consideration and resentment of Henry Morton Stanley, Lord Hugh Lugard, King Leopold II, Cecil Rhodes, Queen Victoria of Great Britain and others engaged in the extermination mass genocide of more than 50 million Africans in order to steal their land? Why not resentment for them? Um, like. Pharaoh Ramses II in the Bible, Adolf Hitler, who we know, 
Okay. So I was learning a little bit there, especially when it goes back to the Bible, it becomes really clear. Like some of that I kind of read and didn't understand what I was reading. He breaks it down. And why were these facts missing from pages 39A through 41 and all the other pages of the so-called lesson plans on African-American history? Instead of trying to prove to the children that white Jews are the only people in history which they should relate the Africans enslavement in the United States of America to. Um, okay, he talks about Herodotus. Uh, wait. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost there here. There we go. Yeah. Then I'm going to. Why did I do that? Ugh. Anyway. Okay. So, for example, Moses violated law and order in Egypt, East Africa. Now, check this out. This was just incredible. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this this whole thing. The textbooks used by African Americans with regards to their heroes must revert back to African interpretations of who is bad, good, or different in terms of an African frame of reference. So, African frame of reference, we're talking about Moses. For example, Moses violated law and order in Egypt, East Africa. The authority of the Egyptian nation at the time of Moses was Pharaoh Ramses II who reigned from CA 1298 to 1232 BCE. Following his father, Pharaoh Seti I's death. It was Pharaoh Ramses II who is to be praised for defending law and order to prevent violence in the street and organized crime in Egypt. So he's saying now, Moses was breaking the law. Moses is breaking the law now. Um, okay. If we defend Moses position in violating law and order, we must equally defend this position when African-Americans violate law and order established by modern slave masters of the United States of America's Egypt in Washington, D.C. Moses was a murderer when he premeditatedly killed the. Uh, I'm getting my page right. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, yeah. Kill the Pharaoh soldier. Or is it that we must accept each and every version of history by white, liberal, and orthodox Jewish and Christian authority on everything, including our own selves? Um, okay. Why? Because of our own Judeo-Christian brainwashing that refused to let us know that both Judaism and Christianity had their basic origin and foundation in the book of the coming forth by day, the so-called Egyptian book of the dead and papyrus of Ani. Um, so he was the first person I read who taught me that. And then I looked it up and was like, oh, my God. And I was telling my family, like, yo, did you know that the Ten Commandments came from something that was written by Africans? Like way before Christianity, and they was like, "No," and I said, "Well, doesn't that like change things for you?" No, I just don't think about that. I was just like, Phew. "I just don't." Wow. Um, okay. Thus, we believe, just as we have been taught by our white slave masters, that the only true religion is Christianity, and the only true God is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. By some of us. But some of us even claim to be members of the so-called only pure race, the great white race of the Indo-European, Caucasian, Aryan, Semitic peoples of Asia, certain parts only around India and Europe, etc., etc., etc. Strangely enough, the Hamites and Semites were not too very long ago excluded from membership in the great white race in the United States of America and Europe. So they used to be a part um, from that of that Jewish way so I, I don't know if that like still carries over now but that was the 70s so I didn't want to get too far in the woods when it comes to uh, the different classifications of people but I know 
that I've always felt that racial bias when it comes to Jews. Like it was just Jews are white people, right? Duh. And then a, a fact. And so he's the first person I read when I'm like, oh, that's not it. There's racism again. Oh, what? They just kind of pushed them out and created their own little. Oh, that makes sense. I can see that. <laughs> um, African heroes captured the Iberian Peninsula under the name of Carthini- Car- Carthaginians. Carthaginians. There it is. Before they did it for the second time in history as Moors. The first experience around the 4th century BCE and the second experience in circa 711 CE, which lasted until 1485 when the Moors were finally defeated and driven from Granada, Spain by the so-called Christian Europeans. So that's like my second and third time reading that. Um, And really, I'm getting to the point where it happens all the time. It's a passing feeling where I want to commit so much stuff to memory. But at the same time, I want to learn. I I just want to keep reading more and more stuff. But uh, it comes back around. Let's see. All right. All right. We're getting there. Mm, Yeah. Okay. Certainly the African-American children's hero that led their African ancestors, the Moors, into Iberia was none other than the illustrious General Tariq, the man in whose honor the Rock of Gibraltar is so named. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Um, we note that the original name of the site was called Mons Calpe before it's captured by the Africans who renamed it Gibral Tariq or Rock of Tariq in English. Uh, the black educator in the classrooms of the United States of America cannot forget to tell the African-American children and all other children that there were Roman emperors and Greeks of all stations of life who were in fact black, black people like themselves, a few of which I have shown on page 26, all of whom were similar to the others described by Herodotus as having, quote, thick lips, broad nose, woolly hair and brunt of skin. This is the reason. Chancellor Williams, the destruction of African civilizations, etc. Frank Snowden's Blacks in Antiquity, a Greco-Roman experience. He just goes through the long list of names of books that some of which I've read, many I have not. Um, let's see. And I'll show you those pictures. I'll at least show you those. Uh, let's see. Um, when will black educators call a spade a spade? When shall we be able to say that this Christian or Jewish teacher, priest, rabbi, minister, educator, administrator, etc., is a racist or religious bigot? When will we call a spade a spade? So here it is. And I was like, to that question, which was definitely rhetorical, my answer is when we know the facts, when we've read the books. But people are not going to just read a book. And I'm telling you, man, it's. Uh, but the ones who have do call a spade a spade and i think we have more people now than probably ever before because of the availability of the information like i said in one of the other videos you know i think there's an evolution going on i'm just trying to catch up um let's see also we are not afraid of being called anti-semitic or anti-caucasian because of reverse racism But first, we must understand that racism and religious bigotry are parts of the basic fabric of American civilization, which is a part of the same old Western civilization we hear so much of. Um, However, to combat it, one cannot expect to be congratulated for so doing by those whose best interest it serves, including many, if not most, of the teachers and other white educators throughout the United States of America and its colonies in the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. So that's the thing. When I uh, see all the hype around certain things, I'm wondering, is it with the right intent? Because again, if it's coming from a place of, I need to know this, that's awesome. But a lot of it is coming to like, yeah, tell me the stuff that I can point my finger and have a right to be angry and resentful and want to kill and da 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 da. That's why I want this information because I want to, um, act out of anger. I need some fuel to act out of anger. You know, I see that a lot. Because black educators, most of us at least, are afraid of 
facing the issue of calling a spade a spade. And most of us are even afraid to declare that only works by black authors are authoritative wherever and whenever conflict exists between black and white scholarship over blacks. This is the foundation of authority dealing with the black experience. That's a weighty, that's a, um, that's difficult for one to do. That's difficult. That's difficult. But, um, it makes sense in the context of uh, certain subject matters, right? Like an authority on um, certain experiences, but industries, we can't do that as simply. Um, but I have seen where, let's say we have somebody in the Navy with me with 15 years of experience in this job rating. And I got another person that's lighter skinned, much lighter, lighter complexion, with the less amount of experience, who is going to be, you know, all of the things being equal. So like, no one's favorite because they're just like, duh, 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 you know, like, hey, hey, my buddy, none of that. All of the things being equal, I've seen it over and over again. The experience of this one man is discounted to this young lighter skin person. And I look at it and the only other people who see it look like me and I say did you and they're like <laughs> we you know it's those moments when ugh. anyway strangely enough we even find Negro leaders making trips to the Soviet Union to appeal and protest Russian anti-Semitism but not a single white Jewish leader is seen crossing their path going to protest Jewish anti-Negroism in Israel against Falashas Yemenites Kokim and Chicago black children in the past as it is in the present, have never been told that there are black Jews like themselves as I've shown on page 18 20 um, yeah he shows those it's just not good uh, yeah so for me it was really showing how he could hit all this stuff um as it was coming out like that is a very courageous thing and he definitely paid for that it's it's so much easier because there's such a disconnect such a short-term memory um of people who are alive today from 50 60 years ago that unless it's a monument or that sort of thing they're not going to be as aggressive and like calling out things um especially when it's written so he's speaking about books being written he's speaking about educators that are his contemporaries and it's a lot of blowback at that time but uh for someone like me if i was doing that about somebody 60 100 years ago it's just like who is who cares um well maybe cornell west did it you know i don't know i'm digressing let's let's keep going okay 21 these issues make us black educators mumble mumble among ourselves behind closed doors about anti-blackism white jewish racism and religious bigotry but again we hide why because we are too afraid of our local and national responsible negroes and colored folks in the urban league uh he gives a lot of reasons more than all the reasons so far <laughs> more than all the reasons so far given we are afraid of the loss of our jobs poverty programs to be funded tenure to be secured churches to receive mortgages possibilities of not getting to be a member of the board of directors or trustees of the good liberal whites incorporated the chance of not being considered for an honorary degree and not having our proposal for title one to a thousand etc blocked at the central headquarters of the board of miss education <laughs> uh, yeah okay Maybe it is to be assumed that the Jewish God, Jehovah, told the Israelites to murder and commit genocide in his name. But the Egyptians, in whose country the Jews lived, were not told by their God, Amin Ra, to commit genocide against the Jews. The biblical highlights of this story appear in the book of Chronicles, chapter 1 and 2 of the Jewish Holy Torah, or five book of Moses, Old Testament. So, this is a he just breaks down how you have a people that are breaking the law and they are 
Yeah. It's against Egypt. It's against Pharaoh Ramses II. Um, let's see. He has more here. Okay, here's that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you this one. Pardon moi, pardon, un moment, s'il vous plaît. Juste un moment. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this is um, the uh, Greece, the Africans that were in Greece. Yeah. And Rome and all that. Okay. Definitely want to show that. Now, also I have some other good pictures here. This one's coming up, so we'll get to that one in a second. All right. Yet the irony of the entire myth is that Ham's son Canaan and his children were the ones cursed by their grand ancestor Noah for Ham's wrongdoing. This story is from the sacred scripture of God, Jehovah. God of the chosen people, the Jews. It is the order from a God who had his scribes translated in his Talmud Old Testament according to a version by racist and religious bigots of a European Jewish community. It alleged that all Negroes originated from a curse. Now, this was interesting, right? Um, I had a guy that I worked with and I remember talking to him because he was like a recent convert and I was like, all right, so you, so you're talking about the salvation and stuff and all that and this guy's will. So how do you reconcile? And all I asked him, how do you reconcile slavery with this religion? And he was like, we were just cursed, you know, and he absolutely 100 percent believed it. And I thought, wow, it was just a curse. It no responsibility for the perpetrators. No, it was it was just a curse. Uh, so yeah anyway he ended up getting out uh, a lot earlier but anyway that the Jews were not black that up until this time all the peoples of the world came from a common ancestry with Adam and Eve and were of one color which obviously could not have been white since there were no Caucasians mentioned in the story and they could not have been Semites since Noah's son Sem or Shem had not yet was not yet ordered to get any semi stranger yet the actual story follows so i just highlight a couple of parts from it canaan's children shall be born ugly and black and because you neglected my nakedness they shall go naked and their male members shall be shamefully elongated men of this race are called negroes their forefather canaan commanded them to love theft and fornication to be banded together in hatred of their masters and never to tell the truth so when we examine the present story as it has been doctored, revised, and cleaned up to satisfy modern semantics, we still find its influence in the following races, anti-Negro syndrome, and another white liberal Africana scholar's work, C.G. Seligman, Races of Africa in 1966. So that wasn't that long ago. The incoming Hamites were pastoral Europeans arriving wave after wave, better armed as well as quicker witted than the dark agricultural Negroes. So it's incredible that, you know, you go to a Bible study and unless it's coming from this kind of perspective, you're not going to get the history of how the texts have been revised and doctored and the Council of Nicaea, which he goes into and all of the, um, and how long ago before the King James Version that was, when we call it the lost books of the Bible, they weren't lost. They were chosen not to be in it. Um, things like that. Um, let's see. What is the reason for the sudden turn about face other than the fact that a few black educators like Professor John Henry Clark, George M. Jackson, the list goes on, have written works that expose the type of racism and religious bigotry shown so far. It is also because a few African-American black educators that infiltrated certain black and African studies departments and administer as administrators are bringing forth many of the ancient documents that were pre previously suppressed work showing the glorious heritage of the African people. 
called Bantus, Negroes, Africans south of, of the Sahara, Bushmen, Hotentots, and even niggers, that they were in fact the originators and creators of much of the fundamentals presently called Western civilization and Judeo-Christian ethics throughout the entire educational system of the United States of America. Great Britain, Europe, and all of the areas of the world controlled by the great white race under the common practical ethics of might is right. Long sentences, man. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> um, needless to say, the black educators have forgotten to deal with this racist piece of Christian missionary propaganda, which formed the basis of European Americans telling African American children and adults to this very day that. You must be brought up to certain standards of education, ethics, morality, culture, and civilization. He put white standards of, you know. He he does a lot of those quotes, man, in brackets. It, it's a little distracting. Christian him, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, mm syndrome that prevails to a much greater degree than we often prefer to admit even to ourselves but the black educator must understand that what we have been dealing with all through these pages are the manifestations of the end result of the cultural genocide our people have suffered our african brother pharaoh ramses ii of egypt did not own one black slave in europe yet we continue teaching african black people to hate Ramses II and tell them to sing go down in Egypt and tell old Pharaoh let my people go and I don't even believe I highlighted it but he mentions he mentions the fact that when they're talking about the Pharaoh in the book at no point did they mention his name you don't even know him um, and so he doesn't speak to if that was intentional or not but uh, the fact that we're, we're talking about Egypt um, speaks volumes. And I always saw that in my head. Like, that was something that I could just see. But I didn't have enough wherewithal to try to put it together. And, and then I, I was being, I was pushing away, but my reasons weren't clear. <laughs> um, of course, this only applies to all who are blinded by the Judeo Christian myth. We have been asked to obey at all costs. Thou shalt love thine enemies as thyself. A request which not a single minister, rabbi, priest, or saint could possibly follow unless he or she is totally, totally absent-minded. <laughs> Equally, is it not true that Africans were forced to accept their Christian slave masters, races, and bigoted Christian Bibles without some of the books removed at the Nicene Council? Or conference of bishops in the year CA 322 AD. These are the so-called lost books of the Bible, but not a single book of the Bible was lost. The fact is that they were suppressed by the Christian clergy and theologians in order to maintain their di dictatorial rule and arbitrary edicts like the above. Yet following all of this, do we ever tell the African American children that the African fathers of Christendom Tertullian, St. Cyprian, and St. Augustine were black like themselves, and that they were responsible for much of what Christians all over the entire world accepted as the teachings or sacred words of Jesus Christ to this very day. So, um, that's in his other book, The African Origins. So, I imagine probably a lot of this is actually in there. I just can't remember it because I read it so long ago. Uh, let's see. Are the facts above included in black and African studies textbooks and other required reading materials? Definitely not. And whenever they are mentioned in textbooks written by African people and others, are they accepted into black and African studies courses? Definitely not in departments where responsible Negroes and our white liberals have anything to say about their approval. Those who shape our thinking of right and wrong also control the funds that underwrite, that underwrite our black and African studies curriculum and departments even in so-called Negro schools. And as such, they are able to maintain their roles as masters of cultural genocide in the black African studies curriculum. So I highlight that because that's the kind of talking right there that creates division among ourselves. Um, and I'm sure, matter of fact, I remember hearing some stories about how he would come at some people. So like some of the other scholars didn't really want to work with him or something. 
some of that respect because of the way he would be. He just that tact wasn't always there when he dealt with us. Like he was, he's. He, I mean, the way he talks about the responsible Negroes and um, just ooh man, he just batters them, you know. So, but still, the man was a reader. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Thus it is, if I had to arrange any foundation course outline in African or black studies, I would have to begin with the most ancient of mankind or man-like animals known to us today. So this was cool because he actually started breaking down how he would structure a course, how he would structure an outline for African black studies. And it's like a history course, man. And where do you start? The beginning of humanity? Duh. Right. <clears throat> and I just think about how history was that. Uh, it's just so twisted when you look at the way the books are reading, uh, written. Um, so. For me, I'm thinking about how I'm going to start talking to my children about history. I got to know the right books to go to. Um, to really lay it out for them <clears throat> to counter any narratives that I just instinctively don't agree with that they might be learning but I gotta know it you can't transmit what you don't have <clears throat> not the allegorical garden of Eden at the Tigris and, Euph and Euphrates river valleys we were led to believe in Judeo-Christian mythology written in the first book of Moses Genesis of the Jewish and Christian Holy Bible or Holy Torah uh Another typo that I found. Let's see. Uh, the above map, map is extracted from Donald Wiedner, A History of Africa, South of the Sahara, Vintage Book, 1962. So, 10 years before he wrote this. And he's critiquing this whole thing and pointing out the racism and the... Um, um, I mean, the anti-black spin on it all that stuff but it's only 10 years old at that point so I thought about if I did that now for something written in 2012 like what it requires to be able to to just attack that not just the courage but the understanding oh I just love it <clears throat> um Wiener's negrophobia even made him produce a negro less Congo, Nigeria, Ghana, Burundi, Cameroon, and Angola. He is no different to all of the other white liberals. He just throws them all in category, white liberals, you know. And I honestly believe that a lot of these, who he would call a white liberal, these people have no idea of the implicit biases that are deep down in them. They just, some do. I'm sure some definitely got a feeling about dark skinned people. They definitely do. Same way I definitely have a feeling about some people that I think are criminals. I just, when I see one, I just feel a certain way. You know, like that's a bias I have to get over. Like not getting nervous when I see um, a whole bunch of dudes come up with a lot of tattoos on their neck or something. Like, I'm going to think something. Like, oh, they were all locked up together. Okay. How long they been out? Hmm, are they feeling real aggressive right now? You know, I mean, I'm going to be on the just a little, you know, I mean, the biases, man. But I ain't afraid to admit my own, but anyway. Uh, Cape Lon is the oldest and the only one of indigenous origin. It was used by the Moors, Nubians, Nubians. Uh, in Ethiopia's Africa, the current misnomer adopted by almost everybody today was given to this content by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Uh, let's see. Breaking it down, breaking it down. The second step I would take is to show the African-American children of the directions of African migration from the area of Great Lakes and points further south to all other areas of the continent. So speaking about everything down in like Sudan and the Nubians and, and all that going up into Egypt and then and coming from West Africa and showing those migrations. I just watched a documentary about that. So that was, that's pretty cool. 
I would also compare Dr. Church Ward's and my hypothetical maps on pages 43 and 44 against that of Dr. Wiedner's on page 42 to see the proof of how white racism can and does affect black studies and African studies courses and departments in the various schools and other institutions of higher learning that perpetuate black culture genocide throughout the United States of America and its colonies in the Caribbean Sea and Pacific Ocean. So this was important because he's saying that a part of the education would be to show the racism inherent in traditional education. <laughs> like, here's what happened. Here's how skewed we presented. <laughs> you know, that's that's important. Um, I think that's basically what I'm going to be doing with my with my children, saying like, all right, now here's the truth. What are they saying in that book? What's off in that book that you're reading compared to these facts here? You know, um, <clears throat> What biases do you see in both? You know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, for works such as mine, uh, for works such as mine are usually banned because of their racist contents. The general excuse made by white liberal Africanists that control black and African studies curriculum. <clears throat> Certainly the authority who has to approve my works with respect to what is right and wrong in them for teaching the African American children is generally a white liberal Africanist like Dr. Wiedner or Dr. J. Desmond Clark. I didn't feel the compulsion to look those guys up, so I didn't. Um, oh, but there are some very interesting people. One of the most exciting points about this was he mentioned um, he mentioned two guys, uh, and it was just like they were contemporaries with um, with uh, Garvey and with uh, CLR James and. I think they'll come up. Okay, we'll get to it. What is he, um, what he is in fact warning them in his hypothesis, however, is that he concurs with the lesson plans, examples on pages 39, 8 through 41 and more that the Jews, his Caucasians were never black colored or Negro, not even African like those Africans we still find all over the North, East, West, Northeast, West, and Central Africa. That's kind of hard to read. But is the good Dr. Widener saying that the late professor, Dr. James Henry Priestead? Okay. These are just names. Um, so he's named a lot of people in history that uh, spoke correctly about who they saw in the African continent. So he's just showing off all that he's read, one, and two, discrediting this guy just fully. Um, were indeed that all these people is he saying that all these people all these historians were indeed telling white lies or at least grossly mistaken when they attributed Negroes to Nubia and Egypt during the same period in question even Herodotus the father of European history that they were also in total error okay um, it is the interpretation of facts which gives the evidence of truth meaning and truth varies as much as there are interests to be served. Yeah. Um, okay, so he also shows Pharaoh's. Here's one of them. This is um, Pharaoh Ak Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, the first Christ, whom many have also called the father of the Trinitarian concept. Um, and when you look him up on uh, Wikipedia, what do they say? They talk about, oh, well, they must have uh, distorted. There's a lot of dis distortions in the faith. He probably had an illness. That's why. So like they're taken away from <laughs> like, I know people look like this, man. I worked with a guy that looked like that in, in, in Florida. Like first time that I saw this, I was thinking, oh, he might be a descendant. Like, I mean, to want to put an illness on it because of his African features. God. And that's Wikipedia, too. Ugh. Just bad taste in my mouth. And then his mom. So if that wasn't enough. Let's look at his mom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Queen Ty. Yeah, so he has both those pictures in here, but they're just not very good pictures. So I just went ahead and looked them up. Um... Yeah, man. I mean, it's just the history is so rich and uh, I haven't known it. So, 
let's keep going. Almost done here. Um, a lot of pictures. He talks about the Sphinx as well. He just fills up the pages with um, pharaohs and queens and showing off their African features. You know, it's not the first, not the first person to do that. Um, let's see. No group should be a sacred cow or kosher bagel that is totally free from from critical analysis as to how they affect or affected the black communities in the United States of America and elsewhere. The black educator must be free to criticize and question anyone, anything, anytime. The final authority on blackness can only come from the black educator. This is not in any manner suggest that any black person is to be taken as an authority on black people's history and heritage no more so than any white person is taken from the street corners of white America and made an authority in white studies. Um, unfortunately, since uh, let me make sure I'm on the right page here. I think this is I'm probably going to wrap up here. Unfortunately, since most of us black educators are African-Americans in physical appearance only, but Europeans and European Americans in training, culture, morals, ethics, and all of the behavior patterns, uh, we are unable to recognize this. I was like, I'm a little bit. That's, I can see myself in that. I'm so sorry. It's like I'm trying. I gotta get out. I'm trying. Needless it is to say that our attitude about the so-called savage in- Indians is hardly any different now than it was when African Americans volunteered for service in the United States of America's cavalry and hunted the red man. We should tell African American children about this ruthless part of our heritage we suffered and let them know that we too must atone for this wanton wrongdoing in which we joined our slave masters in perpetuating to this very day in the armed forces of the United States of America as we continue carrying out the dictates of the commissioner for Indian affairs against the red man's descendants. Um, yeah. Okay. So he talks about, uh, Oh man, this was good. He said, uh, so Harriet Tubman was known as Black Moses and he was like wait a minute see and you can only you can't transmit what you don't know but because of what he knows he hit that on two fronts he said (laughs) who told the creator of this title that the original Moses was not black however if Moses was in fact black then there would have been no need to prefix the name Moses with the word black Nevertheless, the presumption, consciously or unconsciously, is that the color of Moses' skin must have been something other than black. Okay, the above racist title goes much further than presently analyzed. It implies that there were and are no black Jews. Okay, so he goes into the the Jews part. Um, it also implies that Moses, an African of Egyptian birth and heritage, was not like all the other Africans of that area of North and East Africa. Uh, let's see. I want to hear the other part. He said, uh, the same kind of racism and religious bigotry also appears in the article from the New York Post, Wednesday, January 26, 1972, by Steve Harvey, uh, titled Nefertiti Ruled in Her Digs. Uh, let's see. Those inscribed, uh, these inscribed scribes of God who wrote the book of Exodus were so much bigoted that they would not even remember to list the name of the pharaoh or wicked ruler in this story Moses and Passover I think I must have passed it but he was saying how and why would she be a black Moses as if there weren't so many other queens in Africa like why does she have to be equated with uh, this figure that brought Jews out from under the pharaoh and not from all of the women um, that were praiseworthy in African history. And he has like a long list of names. So he's like, uh, first of all, she's a black woman. <laughs> and it, yeah, it was just, he just hit it, man. Cause his love for black women is just so strong. That comes out over and over in his talks too. Um, Pharaoh Akhenaten was in no sense different racially than the other Africans South to North or East to West and Al Kabulan. Their facial types are as common in one area as they are in another. Um, 
fear of the anti-Semitic charges. Even black theologians and ministers have failed their congregations in not challenging this bit of religious bigotry and white racism that is stinked to heaven with its Semitic overtone. I don't even know what that is. What are we talking about? Okay. Uh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> Nat Turner. Uh, okay. If such is a fact, Negro teachers are educated fools or at best trained apes against their own interests as they continue to regurgitate whatever their white educators taught them are the inspired words of God. I'm telling you. So really, I'll just uh, highlight that because that was that that kind of speaking out against the religion, but not so much the religion, but the the blind faith in it with no understanding of its history the way that he speaks to that man man it can hurt it can be like a you know stealing on somebody like they don't even see it coming you just ooh. but uh hey <laughs> what does it all indicate the neck uh that negro educators like their model white teachers have overemphasized the issue of negro slavery to the point where it caused their student victims black educators to become equally ignorant of the facts related to their own heritage, all of which they allow white liberal and or conservative educators to interpret for them. Um, let's see. And uh, here's a lot more here, but it kind of um, so the entire book kind of flows um, flows like a lecture. Uh, all right, here's the last thing. The role of the late president, Abraham Lincoln. We are knowledgeable of Lincoln's private papers for quite some time now of his personal conviction. He freely expressed thusly. I have never said that the Negro is the equal of the white man. Most of us still continue teaching that Abraham Lincoln was a true friend of the Negro. Oh, though he said that I have never said that the Negro is the equal of the white man. Most of us still continue teaching that Abraham Lincoln was a true friend of the Negro slaves. In all of this, we have refused to tell our students that Abraham Lincoln's main goal and priority were only two points, the salvation of the union and the economic system. That if the holding of slaves accomplished these ends, so it would have been. Um, and he talks about uh, Dr. Eric Williams' capitalism and slavery. He mentioned that a couple of times. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, it's like the stories have been told over and over again. I'm just new to them. Um, do the Mexican-Americans visit any shrine anywhere in the United States of America to honor Davy Crockett and Sam Houston for their seizure of the Alamo from their mother country, Mexico? But why do we demand that African-Americans be the only people in the United States of America to honor and worship the memory of their ancestors, slave masters and their acts of genocide? which we still suffer today through the effects of cultural genocide. Uh, yeah, I... Yeah, so he has more like that. But that's that's his whole... I mean, that's the vibe. You get it. And his other books are the same way. So the takeaways are to be able to uh, speak to... speak directly to inaccuracies, to why something is racist, um why it is um, suppressive, what it neglects uh, to tell. Um, he was real good at that. So being able to call a spade a spade requires work because if you feel oppressed, that won't take you very far as far as speaking to what is actually happening. Why is that thing oppressive? Um, he's good at identifying those whys. But even after that identification of the whys, it becomes a matter of um, moving away from victimhood, from being the victim. Identifying victimization, yes. But then being able to say, I'm going to navigate now so that that victimization can end. And I'll even identify the victimizer. Um, but it's not my job to, to expose the victimizer to himself, herself. Nah, uh, let them be fine. Good. Do you, but I can choose now to move away from victimhood 
and act accordingly, man. So, but you can't do that when you're mad. Um, got to calm down. Maybe you can. I don't know. We have failed to examine the real underlying cause for the economic, political, and military pressures brought down upon Liberia for the protection of the Harvey Firestone Company's domination um, of Liberia's rubber plantations. Yeah, man. I mean, he goes into a lot of history. I ain't going to get into it all. It's good because it's hard to read some of his stuff out loud. Uh, But yeah, really good book. I enjoyed it. Keep reading. I'm going to keep reading. Give me some recommendations. Do what you do. Have a good one.